You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hey guys, thanks for coming back to the podcast. You're listening to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, and I'm Mighty Blue, or Steve Adams. As you know, for the past two weeks, I've been asking for and getting your wide-ranging ideas on how I can take the podcast forward and enjoy myself at the same time. I noticed on my return from the UK that the show was becoming a bit of a slog for me, to be honest with you. Yet I realised that it was a problem of my own making. Anyway, I thought about it for a while and I've come up with what I think is a good solution. And it's one that seems to be to the liking of many of you as well. I'll go into it after I've spoken with this week's main guest, John Pearson, or Magellan. John was the same age as I was when I started my 2014 through hike. He's an engaging guy, having been in tech for all his working life, including working on the Commodore 64, which I'm sure will have many of you reminiscing about the early days of the computer game. John decided pretty much at the last minute that he was going to hike the Appalachian Trail, and as you'll hear, he had a fierce determination that got him there. John will be on shortly. Then we catch up, possibly for the last time, with our Mighty Blue Class of 2025 member, Michael No Rush the Elder, Gosh. Michael's back home now, but fervently looking forward to the resumption of his hike with his buddy Chopsticks when they resume next year. Then, in keeping with my need, I guess, to streamline the show, we've got the first half of Chapter 11 of Emily Lennon's book, Happy Hiking, during which Emily realises that she has hypothermia. Nasty. So let's get to it and meet John Pearson or Magellan. Our guest today is John Pearson, or Magellan, who recently completed his own Appalachian Trail through hike on August 15th. Hey, John, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. And as it was the first time I did it, you're, let's say, in your early 60s, um, which is what I was, and for many in that group, they've been wanting to do this hike pretty much all their lives. For you, (laughs) it was a bit more of a shorter leading period, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was a few weeks. It was something that uh, right at the beginning of this year, I decided that I wanted to do it. Um, it was something that I had always wanted to do, but it was sort of in the background. All right. It was something that I originally wanted to do as a teenager and just never did it. Um, you know, family, work, everything gets in the way. And then all of a sudden, I had an opportunity to do it on the basis of uh, the beginning, of, basically the beginning of this year. And I got on Amazon and ordered all my stuff. <laughs> now that that can that can be fraught with danger in itself, can't it? But let's come back to why, why why suddenly did this happen? Was this tied into your fact you were retiring, and then all those things that stopped you doing it in the past have gone away? Yeah, I mean, obviously, family. Um, hasn't gone away, um, but yeah. but the the work side, um, yes, I I was all of a sudden allowed financially to be able to do it, to be right. able to go and and you know be gone for six months. And were you planning on six months? Because you did it quite quickly, yeah. didn't you? You did it quite quickly, I, didn't you? Yes, I did it in five months and ten days. Right, and, pretty cool. And, well, five months and nine days. And that was exactly what I said I would do on the first day. Oh, really? Yeah. You, don't tell well, me. You, don't tell me you did a spreadsheet which had you finishing on the date you finished. No, not at all. But what I did do was I had family commitments and had basically said to everybody, "I will be done August fifteenth. Oh, good lord! And you finished yeah. exact exactly that date. I exactly climbed Katahdin August fifteenth. That is a bit fancy. It's good to be to, to be fair to plan it in that way is quite impressive. And it, as you say, there's still family there, and you do do need family buy-in. How was your family supportive of what you wanted to do? Um, fifty percent. Does that mean half of the family was supportive, or they they were partly supportive generally? No, I would say they were fifty percent supportive, as in um, 
the major person in my life who looked after our dog um, was 50% on board. <laughs> was the dog on board? <laughs> Um, well, the dog's fine. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you did you consider taking a dog, by the way? Because many people do. I did, and then basically, so the the thing that I've read that really struck home with me was the dog's not choosing this. Um, and as much as the dog will follow you, and my dog would definitely follow me the whole way, mm. um, the dog isn't choosing to to walk 20 miles a day and the dog's not choosing to go through that. Um, that's like, basically that cycle. The dog's not choosing to, to walk the Appalachian trail. You're choosing to walk the Appalachian trail and you're dragging your dog along with you. That's interesting. We've had lots of people on the show in the past, uh, proponents of taking a dog with them and also against taking a dog with them. One of my observations when I did, actually my first hike was that I see some dogs in the morning and they'd be standing there a bit sort of slinking sideways as they put had their pack put on them again. You could almost hear them saying, we're going again? Because they have yeah. literally no idea. This isn't what they're going to be doing for the rest of their life, do they? No, there's something, there's something to be said about a, a dog's memory. And the dog's memory is something like five minutes. Oh, right? really? Really? So if, you, if you walk out the door of your house, the dog forgets that you're you know, dog doesn't know time, right? Huh. So if you do that to your dog, yeah, you're right. The dog is going to think that that's the rest of his life. That's hmm. that's what it's going to do for for the rest of his life. And and it just comes down to, um, again, I, I think the dog doesn't choose it. Yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> I'm choosing to do it to myself, but the dog's not choosing to do yeah, it. Yeah, and you're right. The dog would absolutely follow you. And, and all the dogs I saw on the trail all followed the person there with as well. And, and I know it's great for some people with their dogs and you know, good on them. Um, you, you have done some backpacking in the past. How extensive has your experience been of, back, of actually overnight backpacking? Um, almost zero. All right, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Mine was actually zero when I started. <laughs> yeah, let's put it this way. I I had backpacked overnight at least one night. Let's, wow. let's put it that way. Um, I had hiked, day hiked, you know, fairly regularly through most of the national parks and some of the, you know, some of the national parks in Canada as well. Um, but there's a huge, huge difference between going for a walk in Yellowstone and you know through hiking yeah certainly and and did you you probably got used to that difference pretty quickly um how 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 did you approach this then because you know you know what what about it made you think this is a thing you'd like to do spend literally 150 nights or 140 nights in the woods so what was what was the thought process that made you think this is a good idea you know it 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 never really occurred to me about hiking it, um, it, it was a challenge to get from Georgia to Maine. In other words, the, when I first thought through the problem, it was, it was nothing really to do with hiking. It was to do with, you got to get from Georgia to Maine. And it really wasn't until I had been on the trail for a month maybe a month and a half, but before I really realized that this was all about hiking and the way to be successful at this was to think about this in terms of 75 mile, 50 mile, whatever sprints, as in I, for, I very quickly forgot about the fact that it was 2,200 miles and started working on the got to get the next 50 miles, 50 miles, 50 miles, 75 miles. And that obviously worked, worked for you because you obviously got there in the end. But um, you're right. I mean, I remember getting Neil Gap after about four days and I was bloody exhausted when I got there. I thought to myself, I've got, yeah. I've got to do this so many more times. So it is preposterous almost to be looking at Qatar and really saying, I'll, I'll get there eventually. So looking at, looking ahead to say, I don't know, Hot Springs as a first place to think of, really, let's get there first, then Damascus after that maybe. Uh, yeah, bite it off one, one bit at a time. And so the timing 
of the height was to coincide with retiring. What actually was your career? So um, I was a technology executive. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is uh, I started out life writing video games for the Commodore 64. Oh, there'll be, there'll be people who'll be listening to this will definitely identify with that remark. <laughs> yeah, well, so that dates me a bit. Um, <laughs> and then I've been involved in technology through, uh, through management consulting out of New York, through um, startup startups in the Bay Area, unfortunately, none that you would have ever heard of. Sad, uh, sadly. <laughs> sadly, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then I finished up my career in technology as uh, a CIO, and we developed uh, personality assessment testing. So just, you say this is something you'd wanted to do. What, why do you think it was something you could achieve? Or are you one of these people who sets a goal and achieves it? Or was this something that you thought, well, it's a test for me to do? Or did you just think you were going to do it anyway? Yeah, it's interesting. It's um, and I and I don't want to sound egotistical, but um, by the way, when somebody says that, <laughs> they're about to say yeah. something that sounds up. So you carry Absolutely. on. <laughs> yeah, and and I think the because the my real answer is that when I set a goal, mm. I just achieve it, and I may fail at at it multiple times, but eventually I achieve it. Um, it's been very, very rare in my life, and it has happened, where I've set a goal and not been able to achieve it. And so I didn't even, it never occurred to me that I couldn't do it. Um, it occurred to other people, like <laughs> uh, people around me said, yeah. oh, that's crazy. And, and you know, any amount of time you spend, even if you stop, it'll be fine you know, blah, blah, blah. But no, that's not how I looked at it at all. Is it important to you, though, to enjoy it? Because this could be five or six months of purgatory for some people, couldn't it? Um, yeah. The, the question of whether it's enjoyable or not is an interesting question because many people, uh, lots of people have asked me, did I have fun? And, you know, my answer is no. I probably didn't have fun. Um, I I had fun periods of time. <laughs> I had certainly fun days. Um, but but if you when you're walking twenty miles a day or fifteen miles a day or whatever the average works out to, um, you know, is it fun? No, not really. Is it a huge sense of satisfaction? Yes, absolutely. Most, most certainly. Right? Yeah, I totally that, agree. That, I think, is is what really kept me going was it was a huge sense of satisfaction. Were there, nights, guess, sorry, were there nights you right. spent, spent in your tent thinking, geez, I don't want to do this anymore? No, not really. No. <laughs> there were moments, though, weren't there? <laughs> there there must have been moments. moments. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely there are moments. You know, I mean... <laughs> you know, on the third day straight that it was pouring rain, oh, yeah. um, you know, and everything is soaking wet and it's, everybody's miserable. Um, yeah. There, there's sort of like, but you know what? The first thought was, well, where's the closest town as opposed to, I want sure. to quit. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and, and that will alter the trajectory of that day, which always helps you if you can go into some town, which is why I think the AT is such a great hike to hike. You can get off it and recharge if you particularly want to pretty quickly, can't you? Oh, absolutely. I would, I would use an example where um, I was walking with another person and we were just having a terrible day. I mean, it was pouring rain, it was terrible mud, and we came to a road crossing and we were like, well, I wonder if a shuttle could pick us up for a hostel here. <laughs> and, and sure enough, within an hour, we got picked up and nice. got shuttled to the hostel. Absolutely worth it. Now, how did you prepare, given that you had given yourself quite a small lead in time? I know, I know you said you wanted to do it, but you weren't backpacking. Uh, uh, so nope. you had to pretty much start from scratch, I presume. Did you prepare, how did you prepare physically and how did you prepare mentally? Or is the mental part of it, you're pretty, 
you, you sound like you're pretty strong on that anyway. So physically, I thought I had prepared um, mm -hmm. because I was walking the dog 70 or 80 miles a week. And I sort of thought, well, that will equate to, you know, comfortably being able to walk, no problem. Unfortunately, the problem was I was doing that in Daytona Beach in Florida. <laughs> it's dead flat. You know, I mean, the only up and down is uh, the intercoastal bridges. Um, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It was nothing like it was nothing like the trail. Um, and then from a mental perspective, it was. I always knew that I would finish like it, that. That was never never occurred to me that I wouldn't finish hmm. um, and trying to finish in on the date that I said I would do it on. Um, you know, I, I mean, the best example I can give you is that, that I was with another person by this point in Maine. Um, we walked the last 80 miles in three days. Wow, and that you know is what, not hanging about. Yeah. So you, so yeah. you would, so that the importance of finish on the fifteenth of August became the the target that kept you going. I presume, absolutely, yes, oh. yeah. And 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 the hurricane hit. Um, I can't even remember the name of the hurricane. It was Dottie or something like that. Um, Debbie, Debbie, wasn't it? Debbie, that's it. Sorry, yeah. I knew it yeah. started with a B. Uh, and Debbie hit, and we had a day where we couldn't move. Like we just literally couldn't move. So we wow. stayed in the shelter and that put us a day behind and we literally caught up that day by killing ourselves to <laughs> make it to Baxter State Park on the, right, on the right date to be able to climb Katahdin on the right date. But let's go back to getting there because I normally ask people what their impressions were on those first few weeks on the trail. Um, and you, you know, if you said it was a bit of a shock for you in many ways, having walked around Daytona Beach with your dog. Um, but you had quite a mission getting to the trail in the first place. Tell us how you got there. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> if you go back into my career, I am used to traveling for business. And traveling for business involves planes, trains, automobiles, whatever, um, and nice hotels. And I made the decision that instead of uh, flying from Daytona Beach, which I could have done to Atlanta, um, I wanted to be able to take, uh, I did take trekking poles and uh, stove fuel. And I sort of thought, okay, well, I could rent a car and drop it off at the airport. No, that didn't seem like reasonable. So anyway, I ended up taking the overnight Greyhound from Daytona Beach to Atlanta. Wow, that's living it up. <laughs> yeah. And let's put it this way. It it was an experience I will never do again. <laughs> yeah, you refer to it as a shocking experience when we spoke before, which is uh, good, <laughs> good word for it, yeah. Yeah, so I'm trying to be politically correct. Yeah, um, it, it, it. Was, it was an incredibly shocking experience to see the level of individual that travels by overnight bus from Daytona to Atlanta. I bet. And, <laughs> and then it was even more shocking when I'm trying to leave the bus station in Atlanta at 4.30 in the morning because Marta in Atlanta opens at 5.00. And the armed security guard is telling me to not talk to anybody on the way to Marta and keep my head down. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which I did. Um, multiple people tried to talk to me, but I just sort of kept on walking. So that was my uh, introduction to, to uh, headed for the trail. And then, of course, I got on a, a shuttle, which will uh, remain nameless, and the shuttle driver gave me very bad information and I basically ended up walking 14 miles <laughs> on the approach trail which Fault is very impressive to considering it's only eight miles or eight and a half miles I think I did it two weekends ago um, okay. the, the, the approach trail and it, and it felt like 14 miles but I know it wasn't really so no. where, where, did, did you ever work out where you went you know I haven't looked at the map but but I, I know that I followed his instructions 
to the letter. And while it might have been scenic, it certainly wasn't scenic that day. It was uh, it was a it was the sixth of March, and it was pouring rain. Oh dear! <laughs> so it was a great start, and you started right in the middle of a pretty large bubble because I think the six, yeah sixth of March you said. Um, what were the shelters like in those first few weeks? Because I seem to remember that is the absolute height of the bubble, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure it's the height of the bubble. I think the actual height of the bubble was the beginning of April. But um, it's well, no, certain- no, normally, normally the first of March is is the time where the most people start around that time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, let's put it this way: there was a lot of people around. Right. And were there were there enough spaces? Because having been to and did you stay at the one eventually when you got there? Did you stay at the top of Springer? At that shelter there. I did stay at the shelter, but I camped. I tented. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant, because the space around there, there wasn't a lot of space to actually tent, was there, around there? No, but I had also no idea what I was doing. So (laughs) as much as I saw a a shelter building, I didn't have a clue of what to do with it. (laughs) (laughs) So you bought all this new gear. So you bought all this new gear. And had you actually set it up in in field conditions before you actually started? Only in the backyard. Okay, well, that's all right. It still works. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, at least at least I knew that that tent pole went in this hole. <laughs> right, and it works out because you you know I always think about these things. You, know, you you make a mistake, just don't do that thing again, and then keep no. making mistakes, and then don't do those again, and then you then you work out how to do it. And I know yeah. that you ran out of food before you got to Neil Gap. How much did you take with you? How much did you take with you to start with? Or was that part of the problem of going that 14 miles and going out of your way? Because you use up your food pretty early, I suspect. No. So basically, I had looked at the, the information that I had looked at um, was that it was 31 miles to Neil's Gap. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 31 miles to me seemed like three days. All right. So I had three days worth of food, and it ended up taking us five days. Right. Yes. So yeah, I mean, uh, and the interesting part is the other people that I met originally that first day, um, everybody ran out of food. Right. <laughs> like everybody did the same calculation. Wow. That, wow. That, that Thirty-one miles is only going to take three days, so you know, only bring at most four days worth of food. Yeah, I, I I always say I always say eight miles a day is most you need to do when you get first get get hiking. So four days for me was always going to be that trip. Um, and from my experience, a through hike is something you kind of need need to ease into, kind of learning what not to do on trail so you can feel like, before you can feel at home. With that difficult start, did you feel discouraged at all by things that were going wrong, or did you just keep plowing on through? I'll work it out. Honestly, I kept plowing on through, but the one thing that one thing that did help me was uh, I met two people from Maine day one, and mm-hmm. um, they will remain nameless. But the two people from Maine, the one person got all the way from Maine, including getting the tattoo, full sleeve tattoo of the Appalachian Trail on his arm. Mm-hmm. Um, he made it four point four miles. <laughs> So, so we made it basically to the first road, right? I mean, the first road is only is is four point four miles in, and he he got to the first road and he goes marching up the road, and we're like, um, "Where you're going the wrong way?" And he was like, "No, nope, I'm not. I'm out of here." And he had the full sleeve tattoo as well. Excellent. <laughs> you know, I I still haven't got my tattoo from the trail. I know I want to get one one day, but I'm a bit too old to be doing it, I think, really. Uh, but really, getting the full sleeve and then quitting after four and a half miles is not a great thing. Um, no. And you did about a 1,000 miles with one guy. Absolutely. Why did you, you split up with him? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairly complicated story, but the end of the, the, the basic end of the story is that he felt he could go faster. Okay. And, um, you know, we, we are both, both of us are six feet. He has long legs and I have short legs. <laughs> You've got long and, body and short legs. <laughs> yeah, I have a long body and short legs, which means I have a short stride. Yeah. And he is the absolute reverse. He has long legs and a short body. 
and no, well, that doesn't sound right, but he he has um, he's much more proportionate in terms of longer right. legs, right, right. shorter body, and so um, he felt he could go faster. Could and, he? And uh, well, he's still on the trail. <laughs> He hasn't got. He hasn't made it to Maine yet. Uh, oh, I, I didn't name him deliberately, by the way. Uh, yeah. are, are you taking a sort of perverse delight in that, or what? <laughs> um, you know what? The funny part is, I feel a some level of guilty, right? Let him go. <laughs> I, yeah, I feel like if we had stayed together, I maybe would have finished slightly later than I did, but. Um, we would have finished together. Yeah. Oh, well, and, that's the way it and, goes. You know, yeah, you're right. It is the way it goes, but it's still some sort of level of guilt. So when you were then by yourself as a solo hiker, because I think those things are two entirely different hikes. You hike with somebody. Absolutely it's a great right. thing to do. It's a great thing to do to be a solo hiker as well. Did you find your, Did you find it easier to be a solo hiker than hiking with somebody else? In one sense, yes. And in another sense, no. So, so yes, it's easier in that you get to make your own decisions. Sure. You don't have to ask anybody. You don't have to go, oh, well, what about this or what about that? You just do it, yeah. right? Um, that's one part of it. But the other part of it is um, you are by yourself, right? <laughs> Let's put it this way. I showed up to do the trail by myself and, you know, it was okay to be by myself. A lot of people do though, John, don't they? I mean, they, they really, you know, I think people turn, people can be with as many people as they like and they can be by themselves. You know, I think you have to be comfortable with your own, own in, in your own space anyway, when you're out there, because you are going to be by yourself sometimes. Did you get a lot out of that, that solitude every now and then? Uh, you know what? I think the one of the things that you get from being by yourself is a huge amount of thinking time. Right? Yes, sometimes uh, too much. Yes, sometimes you're right. Sometimes too much. I mean, the, the one thing that I found on the trail, there was just a huge amount. Like basically, you're walking for twelve hours a day. So yeah. you know, if you're walking by yourself for twelve hours a day, um, you've got. 12 hours to reflect on all sorts of things that you don't necessarily need want to reflect on, but, no. you, but you do, right? Absolutely. I, I actually walked for 800 miles my first hike without headphones in. Okay, yep. Uh, but I started to drop my thoughts. I started to drive myself crazy, so I had to put headphones in to listen to something else instead of the constant nonsense going around in my head. And, and I want to ask you, you shared something with me the other day that you've been sober for two years. How does a person who is two years sober coexist with other hikers when it's party time? Because it often is on the trail, isn't it? Yeah. So I think that the my answer is everybody everybody has to do their own thing. And sure. it's incredibly hypocritical of me to say you can't drink, right? Like – I just think that that's just I can't do that. I can't say sure you know, somebody because because a decision that I've made doesn't equate to a decision that you like. Just because I've decided not to drink doesn't mean that you don't you can't drink. Of course. Um, now, having said that, I don't particularly want to be around a whole bunch of drunk people, <laughs> but you know. But have you no, have you noticed when you are sober, yeah, you realize how bad some drugs can be. Yeah, <laughs> I resemble that remark. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, and the and yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like if if people want to have a beer with dinner or a glass of wine or whatever, or a few drinks, that's fine. But when people are getting blind drunk. Mm. Uh, the way I was previously, um, you, we're not good company. I mean, yeah. yes, we were good company with each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I want I good want, company with sober people. <laughs> I must have met when I first moved to America. Um, this might be oversharing a bit. I once said that uh, I woke up for 35 years, seven days a week, 365 days a year with a hangover. 
because I thought everybody else did. Everybody in my family, well, all but one in my family did. And it's kind of what what people did. And, you know, it's a, it was a British thing. And America doesn't seem to be that, that way at all. Um, now, moving on through the hike, I know that you found that you thought the whites were tough, but you found that Maine was much tougher. I'm kind of surprised you found it much tougher. In what way did that come across to you? Or were you just getting tired by then? So Maine is the last, I think it's like 280 miles, right? Or so. About 260, uh, I think. Maybe 280, yeah. 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 It's something like that. And by mile 1900, I was counting down the miles. All right. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I was tired. I was hungry. I was done with it. Sure. Right? And, how, much, and how much weight did you lose, by the way? I lost 50 pounds. Right, 50. I lost, yeah. I lost 60 first time, 50 second time. And oh, wow. a, a bit of a warning, by the way, John, I put mine on with interest each time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been slowly working at it, and it's like, yeah, i got to stop eating the muffins and the ice cream because <laughs> I'm still eating the muffins and the ice cream. <laughs> yeah, that's going to do it every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it was one of those things where it was like, um, intellectually, I know Maine is beautiful, but I could care less. As, oh, really? I could have cared less at that point. I was, I was like, I was so done seeing lakes and ponds and trees and rocks and roots and, you know, it just was. I was done. Kind of a shame because it is a beautiful, beautiful state, but it is as tough as hell as well. I, I, I agree with you in many ways. It is really tough. But you, you then got to Katahdin and you had a pretty bad weather day from from what you told me, did it, did that take away from the experience? Do you think, I mean, not, not that you know the difference between having doing a, a summity on a, a sunny day, but was it, did you find it quite wearing to get up there in bad weather? Um, yes. So, so I think that the, I, I, one of the things that I, that I've talked about with a bunch of people um, on the trail is we don't care about views anymore. <laughs> right? Like at, at a certain point, you've you've seen all the views that you care about, and you know. I don't agree with that, by the way. But that's 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 how you saw it. Quite agree. That's fine then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. I, it, it really was a challenge to get up and a challenge to get down, right? And I had expected the sign to be hugely emotional, and it was like we rushed to get up in bad weather we rushed to turn around and you know like i looked at the pictures the other day and it was um it was 11 40 in the morning wow, and, yeah it w which wasn't bad yeah. um, but we had set 12 o'clock as our turnaround time uh -huh. and you know it literally was a rush to get up and a rush to get down yeah and, kind of a shame kind of yeah, a shame yeah I, and one side of me says I'd like to do it again just to have a more positive experience. That, and then I say, shake my head and go, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you decided to do the AT effectively within a few weeks of getting started. You know, actually you made yeah. the commitment to do it. Are you a one and done person now? Is, is that, has that scratched your uh, project type itch or are you going to, is this going to lead to other hikes? Uh, I am waiting with bated breath for October 1st because it's the opening of getting a PCT permit <laughs> for so next, you, next year. So you, have been, so you have been infected then? <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, do I want to go hiking? No, I want to go through hiking. I felt so that way. Right. I say, I, I've often said on the show, I, I'm not sure I particularly like hiking. I love the idea of a through hike, beginning of the Absolutely. south and finishing the north. I love that idea. Yes. So, so if somebody said to me, "Well, you know, I'm I'm actually here um, visiting Canada right now." So if somebody said to me, "Well, let's go hiking on the Cataraqui Trail for a day," I'd be like, "No, not interested." <laughs> <laughs> but if somebody said, Hey, let's go do the Terry Fox Trail, which goes from one end of Canada, one side of Canada to the other. I'd be like, hmm, let me think about that. Let's let's talk about schedule. <laughs> well, hang on, hang on, hang on. You've got somebody who supports you fifty percent, 
first time. So how's that looking for a second? Have, have you, if you get the permit, because not everybody does, uh, and then you and then you're going to go. Uh, what ha- what happens then? Is is that is the buy-in important? Well, I, I may have to look for a different person to look after the dog. Let's put it that way. Okay, there we go. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, look, you, it, it's a. Uh, it's been really a delight talking talking with you, John, and uh, congratulations on doing that. And if you do happen to do the PTT next year um, and get your permit and stuff, come back and tell us the story about that as well, would you? Absolutely, I will. Thank okay. you very much for having me. Appreciate it. All the best. Cheers. All the best. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. He's a kind of phlegmatic, relaxed guy, isn't he? He didn't have fun, but he had fun days. I don't really mean by that. It's definitely not all sunshine and roses out there, though you remember the days that make you feel that way. Looking back, both years I threw hikes were fairly decent as far as weather was concerned, and I've noticed hikers recently getting deluged or burned to a cinder, often one day following the other. And he had the best of both worlds, with half of his hike with a partner, followed by the second half without a partner. On balance, I think I prefer to hike with a partner, but I can certainly identify with what John and others have said about the freedom to do exactly as you please. I guess it's different strokes for different folks. Now, let's move on to the future of the podcast. As you know, I'm trying to make both the show easier for me to record, edit and produce, while at the same time keeping the integrity, I suppose, of the program together for the benefit of most of you. Let's start with the main interview. I've always believed it to be the glue that holds the show together, so I'd be reluctant to drop that, and it seems to me you all agree with me, so that stays. I've always tried to manage these interviews to come in at between 30 and 37 minutes long, and by and large, that's what's happened. In the future, though, I'll pay less attention to the clock and let things unwind a bit more freely, and not worry unduly if I hit 40 or even 45 minutes. Many of you kindly prefaced your comments by saying that you enjoy all of the sections of the show, yet it soon became clear that if one section was to go, the overwhelming majority would prefer to drop the book reading. It may not make sense to you all, but the book reading has always been my biggest task in putting these shows together. I tend to carry on with Emily's book, Happy Hiking, yet as you can see today, I'm going to be breaking chapters down into two sections when I feel that they're too long for the new format. When Emily's book is done, I will not be looking for more books to read, though I'll be happy to speak with authors who've got a book they want to sell. But it's in the middle section, most noticeably in the mighty blue class of whatever year, that needs the most attention. If you recall, we started back in 2018 with Jessa, and as it happened, Jessa, or Addie, went the distance so I could follow her all the way to Katahdin. Many of you were invested in that success, so I followed up with a whole new podcast featuring Bruce Matson or RTK, as he, too, made it to Catan. In both those cases, I introduced the hikers to you all a few months prior to their departure, getting insights and interviewing them in more depth as they prepared for their hike and then set out. The last few years, I've never been fully happy with how it's worked out, mainly because I've had so many people to follow. From what some of you say, it's the interviews that you want kept, so I've decided to follow just two hikers for 2025, bringing them onto the show just one a week from about eight to ten weeks prior to their respective starts. I've already identified and asked the woman I'd like to follow, and she said yes, so I now need a guy to consider the commitment I'm asking of you, which is basically to keep me informed as to what's going on, make yourself available to a call every other week, and be prepared to entertain and inform our listeners. If you think you could be up for that, please reach out to me at steve at hikingradionetwork.com and we can have a conversation. So, what do you think? It's going to work for me, so hopefully it's going to work for you. And uh, the program should be now down to something like an hour a week, which makes it much more manageable. Now, let's catch up again with Michael Garsh or No Rush, The Elder. Morning, Steve. Hey, Michael. How are you? I am fine. <laughs> You're fine. You're back home, aren't you? I am. I am. Um, the weather's way different down here. <laughs> <laughs> and your um, uh, the last time we spoke, you were looking forward to Chopsticks Return and, and so on, and uh, you were going to hike, car- carry on. I can't remember where you were he- heading heading to before we actually, you know, before you actually were going to stop. But actually, you stopped more recently, didn't you? So what actually happened, and what was the thought process? So um, I left Hanover hiking north um, 
and hiked to uh, Moose Mountain and then hiked on to Route 25A and then I did some slack packing. So I actually got as far as mile 1807 on the north side of Mount Musalak. Oh, right. So, so you went over, you actually went over Musalak. I did. I did. And, and I'm glad I did it uh, north to south because that north side was very, very steep. Um, but I could tell that when I was on top of Mount Musalak that I had acclimatized because there was probably maybe 10 other people up there. And I was sitting uh, up there eating lunch, you know, my peanut butter and, and gummy worms. And <laughs> I just had on a shirt and my, and my pants. And everybody up there was in jackets and, and sweaters. I'm like, wow, it's not that bad up here. It was a very beautiful day. It was very clear, but windy. Right, right. So it's a great, great view up there, isn't it? It's one of the best. If, when, are you, when you're hiking northbound, it's, it's, at that stage for me, it was the best view I'd seen so far. And I remember there's a video of me talking to someone uh, and, and I'm saying, this is as good a view as it gets. You know, it really was just amazing. So... The climb itself, you say you went, you did the north to south of Musaluk. Yeah. So I did that as well. I did that as well. And I agree with you. I would hate to go down that, going northbound, going down that. Right. And even going going down the south side of it was still kind of steep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. You, you, you suddenly realize you're, you've suddenly reached a different level, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Because I, I took pictures of the, the whites from there and I was like, Wow, this is this is something different, and I made the right decision, especially after watching some of my friends that had already have have done it after me. Um, how steep it was, and I was like, you know, chopsticks would, especially after his surgery, he would have never been able to go through this part. Right. So, so you so you yeah. got to eighteen hundred and seven miles, and I did, and I, I think the. As I remember, the plan was chopsticks would be coming back. You'd be hiking with him, but you you changed that plan. So what actually happened yeah. then? So he he came back. Um, I drove to Boston and picked him up, um, right. and drove back to Lebanon. We stayed in Lebanon, and then I put him on the trail the next morning from Hanover. And he right. last night he stayed at uh, the Tremore Shelter. Um, it's a, it's a very small shelter, and the next shelter is Stony Brook. But um, I'm waiting to get the, the topper put on my my truck, and it should come in this week. And then I'll mm -hmm. load it up and head back up there, and I'm going to slack pack him till he gets back to the point where he fell and got hurt in New York. Oh, right. So then once – so when's he going to do the bit from Hanover through to – uh, through to uh, Moose Luck, which is the bit you've done now? I will do it again. We'll do it next year when we when we head back, and I'll just right. do what I have already done, just so that I can hike with him. And also, man, it is a great part of the trail as well. Isn't it? I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. But you know what? Going at it fresh, with with no miles on your legs, that's going to be quite tough next year. So, how do you plan to prepare for this in the in the interim? Uh, a couple things, like we're going to hike um, the Penhody Trail. All right, nice. And we're going to hike the um, the Foothills Trail here in South Carolina, and uh -huh. you know we're we're going to do. It. Oh, and I've started running again. So, well, wow, good for you. I've lost all this weight. <laughs> How much did you lose, Michael? Sixty pounds. Well, so did I. Do you know what though? I put on seventy five. <laughs> well, but see, that's why I started running because I don't yeah. want to put all that weight back on. What do you? What about the eating? Because the only posts I've seen of you so far are tucking into a are tucking into a meal. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm still um, trying to watch what I eat, drinking a lot more fluids. Uh, so I mean, I'm I'm still eating my uh, oatmeal and uh, uh, breakfast stuff for breakfast every day. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Special, though, isn't it? Special. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, yep. it's that short period of time you've got to carry on getting the benefit of the of the calorie burning, uh, which doesn't last very long, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I know when we spoke last time, you were pretty pretty sad about things, although you had a plan. So that that that's a good that you had a plan. Yep. Are you feeling with a bit of distance of time, feeling a bit better about it now? On or you know, how, how do you what, what are your takeaways from this year's hike? Um, like I said, to, to make it, to decide that to stop at where we stopped it at, yeah. when I look back on it, it is, it's the right decision. 
I, I mean, right. like I said, I, I've, I've watched people and my friends have sent me videos of where they're at and what they're doing. And I still want to, to summit Katahdin with uh, chopsticks. And uh, right. yeah, I, we made the right decision. I have no remorse. Good. Well, that's that's a good thing because you you sounded like yeah. you were a bit up, upset last time, but and, and and I know it's you spent a lot of a lot of this year doing this and trying to go towards this goal, and suddenly when it's slightly out of reach, but now you just pushed it back a year, which is perfect. You know, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna go with there next year with your buddy and spend that time hiking with him in the interim. So I think that kind of works out for you. But what about you know your, your, your internal takeaways? How you you know how, what has this done for you? Um, it, it showed me that, I mean, I can do stuff that is harder than I thought it was going to be and I can still do it. And I can real, the other great thing is I've never had a lot of really close male friends and, right. and I've, I've got one here in South Carolina and now I got chopsticks, you know? And, and so that, that bond is really tight and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I went. I mean, it, it's, it's a great feeling. Do you call each other? What does he call you? Because you've got a long, you got a long trail name. Does he call you No Rush or No Rush the Elder or Rush? What's he call no, you? He, 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 no Rush. His wife calls me No Rush. He calls me No Rush. So I refer <laughs> to him either as Chopsticks or Tom. Either way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I'm glad we were, we were able to follow you, Michael. You know, and I wish we'd we'd met a little earlier. To, to, to be, but of course, I was away myself, so I couldn't catch, right. capture the beginning of your hike. But you know, I know it's been um, it's been tough, but it is a tough thing to do. And you're right; you've learned you can do tough things. So I think that's certainly something to take away uh, from it and enjoy it. And and I. I I, I don't know whether you know I'm, make, I'm making a change to my podcast next year. I'm not going to be following quite as many people as I did this okay. year and certainly not as I did last year. So, um, you know, we, we'll still catch up with you. And make sure that I, 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 I see you on to Katahdin at some stage. Uh, and okay. uh, all I can do is wish you well with this and hope it uh, really works out for you with Chopsticks and you enjoy your, your hikes in the interim and you uh, uh, get moving towards Katahdin next year. So just stay in touch, okay? Okay, and the other thing I want to tell you, the other takeaway that I got that I just thought about is there's still a lot of great people out there. I mean, all you hear about it on the news is all the bad things. There's yeah. a lot of great people out there on, there on the trail yeah. or around the trail. So, yeah, that was awesome. It's funny, actually. Social media um, is, is, is to blame for a lot of things, and I found it, uh, it creeping into even the Appalachian Trail um, subject. You know, the Appalachian Trail Podca uh, um, Facebook pages. There's right. so much vitriol even in those these days. And the one I and the Southwest Coast Path I did earlier this year in the UK, that was such a friendly, helpful site. Everybody wanted you to succeed, as it was when right. I was hiking the Appalachian Trail in the you know the last decade. Um, but I right. think things have changed, and and I'm I'm sad for the way this is going. And I just hope these these admins can do something about their pages to keep this bullshit down and and get people to be more encouraging funny enough the the very encouraging thing is that young lady um tara dower who just finished the fastest known time did it That's in 40 days time. michael can you can you believe it For, did it, did no, it in 40 I days <laughs> but all of that was positive so i'm really pleased about that so hopefully that'll be a, a, a model for the rest of us in future but look Glad we came came to see you. Glad we visited every now and then, and that you kept it going. And uh, we'll stay in touch, but we will certainly catch up with you next year when things get going. Okay. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for everything you do for us. Okay, buddy, you're welcome. Okay, mate. Well, look, have a good Christmas. <laughs> but I'll be I'll be yeah. the first to wish you a happy Christmas. <laughs> thank you, my friend. You too. Okay, buddy. Take it easy. Bye. Um, bye, bye. So, Michael and Chopsticks are going to head out again next year to get it done. I thought it was quite poignant when you referred to Chopsticks as a second male friend. You really do meet extraordinary people out there, especially if you're open to them and presenting the best of yourself. These two guys, who may have had nothing in common when they first started, found a bond that's going to endure into next year with other hikes, as well as a return to the trail and hopefully to the top of Katahdin. I can only wish them well. That just leaves Sandra Lee of our class of 2025, We'll circle back with her next week. Thanks, as always, goes to our wonderful donors, many of whom have been with us for several years now. This week, our recurring donors were Kevin Weidman, Emmanuel Bravoramas, Brian Olsop, Emily's Escapades, Glenn Ferguson, Jessica Diaz, Bruce Brinker and Hugh Ickreth. 
Also, Jamie Dietrich made a generous donation telling me that Cypher, my dog, appreciates your podcast as it gets us out for good long walks in the woods. To be fair, Jamie doesn't actually say that he likes them, but I'll take it, the Cypher does. Thanks to you all. I appreciate you all so much. Finally today, Emily faces the dreadful hypothermia. Funnily enough, as I was reading it, I realised she had it before she did. But as ever, her hiker friends came to her rescue. I'll see you next week. Chapter 11. Hypothermia. A nice hiking rhythm was taking shape for me. I would hike a few days, come to a town, resupply, clean up, do my hiker chores, rest and do it all over again. It was a simple life, filled with so much adventure and friendship. Some days were great and some days were miserable. I never knew what the day would have in store, but I was always excited to find out. Good weather didn't always mean good days, and bad weather didn't always mean bad days. Everything was relative to how I was feeling on any particular day. My mental state was the main factor contributing to how the day would go, so I would try my best to put forth a good attitude, even on some days when I had to fake it until I made it. But leaving Irwin on April 13th, I didn't have to do any artificial positive attitude adjustments. My hiker rhythm was on autopilot, and the two days rest had me ready to go. The 17-mile hike to Cherry Gap Shelter seemed effortless. I was ready to push on past the shelter, but three hikers from my current bubble already had a nice fire going. They encouraged me to stay. August, Cranip and Nomad had already claimed a space in the shelter. I set up my tent. I liked to be in the shelter when it was raining, but my preference was my own tent. Shelters usually had mice and almost always had snoring. While I erected my tent, I joined the crew around the fire for some chit-chat while I ate my supper. Nomad and Cranip were already conversing about dating. Nomad was boasting that he only dated older women. I believe he was in his twenties. Feeling a little feisty, I decided to join in on this conversation. Growing up with four brothers and mostly guys in my neighbourhood, I was used to locker room talk. It went like this. Me. So, Nomad, where would I fall in the spectrum of your dating possibilities? Nomad. How old are you? Me. 49. Nomad. No offence, but that's just outside my upper age limit. Me, why do you limit yourself? You don't know what you're missing. Us older women know how to treat a guy. We know what to do to make you happy. You don't even have to ask. By this time, August, who had been silent up to this point, sitting in the back of the shelter, burst out laughing and shouted, And that's exactly why I only date older women. We all started laughing. I'm not usually so fresh, but it sure was funny. Bad days are usually followed by good days and vice versa. The next day was wet and miserable. My journal entry for that day was one sentence long. Wet, rainy, windy and muddy. Enough said. I can remember that day and the next like it was yesterday. Not only did we battle the rain and wind, we had to climb up over Rome Mountain the first day, then Hump Mountain the next. Elevation was just over 1,700 feet at Irwin. We ended at just over 6,100 feet at the top of Rome Mountain. The shelter was located at the summit, making it the highest shelter on the Appalachian Trail. The day was soggy and miserable, and as we climbed it, it only got colder. Rain started early in the day and kept us soaked. Several of us on the trail leapfrogged from time to time. Familiar faces included brother-sister duo, pumpkin butt and fruit smoothie, and Carl and walking man. These four were my hiking family. We didn't always hike together, but the five of us kept close tabs on each other. Late in the afternoon, the clouds dried up and the sun peeked out with a soft, teasing breeze. It looked like I would be dry before reaching the shelter. That thought barely finished in my brain when the heavens opened without any warning and re-soaked me. I didn't even have time to pull out my rain jacket. So much for being dry. It rained so hard that the trail, now a trench worn out by years of hiking, turned into a stream bed. I was hiking up and the water was gushing down. Wherever the trail may have been flat, there was over five inches of standing water to tread through. My feet were soaked and cold, but I noticed they didn't hurt. The hike to Rome Mountain Shelter seemed to never end. I called up to August at one point, who usually hiked very fast. He was tall, lean and fit, but he didn't like the rain. This wasn't his first rodeo. This was his sixth through hike. One time I had asked him why he hiked it so many times. I enjoyed the friendship, views and peacefulness of the trail. I was even liking the routine, but I was dreading the long distance and suffering. I couldn't even fathom doing it a second time, let alone six times. 
He never gave me a definitive answer. Instead, he replied, ask yourself that question after you've been home for a month and you will have your answer. August was familiar with the trail, but even he was fooled by the many false summits we experienced on the way up Rome Mountain. Just when we thought we were there, the trail would turn and continue upward. It was like being in line at Disney World. It just kept going and going. I finally arrived at the Blue Blaze Trail leading to the shelter. A couple of dozen hikers were already at the cabin. I secured a spot in the loft, then decided to claim the last one on the main level instead, so I could slip out early in the morning without being too bothersome. The spot I claimed was extra wide. I was holding a place for walking man. Pumpkin, Smoothie and Carl set up outside. They didn't like the shelter life. I didn't either, but I liked cold rain even less. Saving spots is frowned upon, so I just set up my stuff wide and when walking man showed up, I made room for him to squeeze in. The guidebook quoted 15 for the occupancy of the shelter, but Hiker Magic almost doubled that number. It was a full house. Whenever several hikers are in such close quarters, there's bound to be a disagreement of some sort. Some want the door open, some want it closed. Some want music, others do not. It was almost guaranteed that when the last headlamp turned out and the last sleeping bag zipper zipped, inevitably the pungent smell of weed would fill the shelter space. Did they really think no one would notice because it was dark? I was not going to go through that again. I loudly requested that the activity be stopped or go outside. I didn't make any friends that night, but I did sleep better. Clothes drying overnight was wishful thinking. They were too soaked to dry under my raincoat as they had on earlier days. I hung them on pegs and nails, hoping for the best. By the morning, they were just as I had left them, only colder. There is nothing like the feel of putting on cold, squishy, dirty clothes to start the day. I had a clean pair of socks, but why bother? My shoes were so wet it would not have done any good. I decided to keep them for later as a treat for my feet. The rain may have stopped temporarily, but the trail bed streams were flowing just as strong as the day before as the precipitation found its way to lower elevations. In some places, the runoff was uncontrolled. It cascaded across the trail in many flash flood zones. Trail design attempted to control the flow with channels directing the anticipated rains away, but even these gullies were no match for Mother Nature. The flat areas were like small lakes, collecting all the water. There was no going around, straight ahead was all I could do. A few times I stopped to capture video of my walk through the deepest parts. Up to this point, I'd only taken pictures of beautiful scenery. I also needed to show everyone back home my misery. It wasn't too bad. It was kind of fun, until it got cold. The fun didn't last too long. The cloud cover never went away, and it rained on us again that second day. The tree cover was surprisingly thick on Rome Mountain, sheltering us from the wind. As the trail descended, the trees became less dense and opened up to a large, windy bald. At one point, I looked up. Ahead, I could barely make out a large figure through the mist and fog. It was Walking Man, fighting his way up the muddy bald. He was fashionably wearing his ground cover cloth as a skirt to help thwart the rain pellets that were beating down on us. He was listing to the right in an attempt to brace himself against the wind blowing him off the trail. I myself walked with the same posture. The wind was so loud, nothing else was audible. I caught up to within a few feet of him before he knew I was there, videoing his laborious journey. Walking Man and I hiked together for a while. It was nice to have company on such a dreadful day. It was a five and a half mile drop at the end of a very long day. We all were tired from the past two and a half days of mountains combined with torrential elements, so we sought the refuge of town. The guys were headed to a hotel where they would meet up with Brian, a friend of theirs from home. I was headed to Mountain Harbour Hostel. From afar, Bruce had also contacted a hotel to make a reservation for me, but the poor cell service prevented his message reaching me. Dreary weather brought everyone in from the woods, and space at the hostel was limited. When I arrived, only tent sites were available, so I reserved one. The last place I wanted to be was out in the rain. Pumpkin and Smoothie were tenting also, but they were far more adaptable to the cold than I was. The tent site rental at least gave me access to the hiker pad and laundry. It wasn't much, but it was dry and warm. The converted upstairs of the barn made a college frat house look like a five-star hotel. It had a small loft with a few beds, a semi-private room, a main area for sitting, a dining table and a kitchen area. The back hall leading down to the animals was a single private room and second bathroom. A few of us late arrivals missed the free shuttle to town, but were able to call the local restaurant that advertised shuttles to their establishment. We had a few minutes to spare, so I went to rinse the ick from my shoes and socks with the hose. 
I didn't realise how cold I was until I attempted the simple task of cleaning my footwear. While I was hiking and moving, my body was warm. But as soon as I stopped, I was no longer producing the heat and circulation to my extremities. Now, nothing was working. Broadway, a young kid in his early 20s, offered to assist me. I'm not one to accept help, unless it's from Bruce. I like to be independent and, in most cases, I like to be the one doing the helping. I politely declined Broadway's offer and thanked him. I did not realise how pathetic I was, but he did. Without saying a word, he took the hose, my dirty socks and my shoes, and then, in a very assertive yet caring way, he said, I got this. Go inside. He explained that I did not look well. His sternness snapped me out of my zombie state and alerted me to the danger I was in. I was trembling all over and didn't even feel cold anymore. I was hypothermic. Thank God for all my hiking friends. The trip to the restaurant was almost a disaster. After we finished our meal, we let the manager know we were ready for the shuttle back to the hostel. He informed us that the shuttle was no longer running for the evening. That would have been nice to know when they dropped us off. I was thinking clearly now that I was dry and had a tummy full of hot food, so I didn't panic. I secured us a ride with some of the patrons who were getting ready to leave. It was amazing that I would freely get into a vehicle with strangers while out on the trail. If only the whole world was this way, strangers helping strangers, what a wonderful place it would be. Thanks to these nameless trail angels, August and myself climbed into the back of the Explorer and did not have to walk back to the hostel. It was getting late and I had not yet set up my tent. I went into the hike lounge to retrieve my items. No Madam Broadway asked where I was headed, so I told them. I insisted I stay inside and said I could sleep on the floor. I didn't feel comfortable with this since I had not paid to sleep inside. They were really concerned for me since I was so cold earlier and still had not completely warmed up. They did not relent, so I asked the others who were staying there if they minded if I crashed on the floor. I was going to say no. I decided to accept the offer. I reasoned that at least I did pay for the tent site and I would pay the owner the difference in the morning, even if it was just for floor space. 